vividly remember a particular morning when I was in grade school. A small, quiet event occurred that I would later come to recognize as an insidious little practice. Some of us arrived in our classroom, myself included, to find on our desk a little white envelope inviting us to a classmate's birthday party. <laughs> I didn't think much about it until recess. And then as I was standing in line, waiting for my turn at jump rope, I overheard one of the girls in the class, a girl who had been badly burned and scarred due to a household fire, say to another girl who apparently also had not received a party invitation, well, we know we'll all be invited to Sharon's party. Oh. I get no credit for this. My mother planned my birthday parties and it would simply never have occurred to her not to include every one of the girls in my class. But overhearing what that meant to my classmate was a big moment in my beginning to learn that justice is always a matter of who is included and who is excluded. Fast forward. I'm 40 years old, and I just earned a doctorate writing a dissertation that might have been titled, What Happens to God When People Go to College? <laughs> <laughs> I've become a professor at Harvard Divinity School, and my work is grounded in an understanding of faith, not as belief narrowly understood, but as meaning making, something we all do, a definition of faith that includes everyone. A supper with my colleague Cheryl and Jim King turns out to be an invitation to collaborate on some research. I'm a bit surprised to hear myself saying immediately, I know what I want to study. I want to study a particular kind of faith. I'm curious about how people come to make meaning in ways that foster commitment to the common good rather than just to me and mine. We end up adding a fourth member to the team, Larry Dalos, who eventually becomes my husband. But that's another story. <laughs> We're also funded for 10 years to study 100 people and to tell about what we found in a book titled Common Fire, Leading Lives of Commitment in a Complex World. Larry and I are very glad that we wrote this book together. But we say that our marriage has been tested in a common fire, and we will never write a book together again. <laughs> If I was to speak of the common good in a group as thoughtful as yourselves, that someone would ask, whose common good? Immediately suspicious that someone has their notion of the common good, that they are prepared to impose on all the rest of us. No, thank you very much. Thus, we backed into the practice uh, behind the concept, the practice of the commons. As you may be well aware, the commons is ancient in human experience. We are social creatures who gather, disperse, and gather again, and our gathering places become a commons. Whether as simple as the crossroads of the village, or as complex as a grand plaza in a Latin country. The classic form in our society was the New England <coughs> Green, where each household could pasture a cow. And around that green was what I have come to call an ecology of institutions. The schoolhouse, the general store, the town hall, a place of worship, the sheriff's office with a jail behind. Over time, a bandstand or gazebo would appear on the common, and also a memorial, often honoring war dead. The life of the commons was woven in celebration and memorial, commerce and communication, play and protest. People met by happenstance and by intention, and they worked out how they were going to live together, over and over again, 
because there were always changing circumstances and because they always worked it out imperfectly. The commons is not a romantic, nostalgic image. Slaves were bought and sold on the common in the South. Jesuits and Quakers were hanged on the Boston Common. The commons is a place where we are, who we are. But the notion of the commons presses toward inclusion. And an experience of the commons yields a sense of a shared life within a manageable frame. Of course, not everyone grew up on a New England green, so I began to ask people where, if ever, they had experienced something of a commons. And I've heard about Friday night high school football games, family dinner tables, festivals, lakes, beaches. But now we all know that we have been swept up into a new commons that is global in scope and personal in impact. We know this economically as we are a part of a global economy. We know it ecologically as we are learning that we are a part of a vast interdependent tissue of life. And we know it ecumenically as cultures are meeting and colliding in unprecedented ways. This new commons is asking something new of each of us, a stretch of imagination, a stretch of heart, a stretch of soul. Never before in the history of our species have we had more access to the knowledge of the suffering on our planet as we do now. And we have never had more access to the wonder of the world in which we dwell. Our collective task now is to figure out together how we're going to create the common good within an unmanageable frame. So, what did we learn about how people become committed to today's common good? We learned many things, three big ones. First, we learned from the people we studied that along the way we need to learn enough trust in life that we are able to wade into the complexity of today's commons. We also need to learn that we have power, that we can make a difference. And everyone we studied had what we came to call a transforming encounter with otherness, meaning that they had met someone outside of their own tribe who had changed the way they saw themselves and others. We all need tribe that sense of belonging within which we know who we are and what we can count on. But we also know that the gifts of tribe can become the sins of tribalism, the us and them divide. But when I meet someone who is other, and I learn that they know pain and yearning and love, even as I do, then us and them can become we, the ground of commitment to the common good. In addition, I have come to believe that it is very difficult for any of us to imagine ourselves as citizens of our global commons if we have not had an experience of what we might call a micro-commons. It matters that we discover that our individual contribution can make a difference within a collective effort. Whether we're playing in an orchestra or on a sports team or showing up at a meeting at City Hall where we learn once again that everything is connected to everything else. After the publication of Common Fire about 18 years ago, Larry and I left Boston and we made our way to Whidbey Island where we came to help create the Whidbey Institute for Earth, Spirit, and the Human Future, a place for gathering and inquiry and inspiration on behalf of the citizenship and leadership that is now needed. As we crossed the country, we stopped in Nebraska, where my great-grandparents homesteaded 
at the end of the 19th century. My great-grandmother, Matilda, lived the multifaceted life of a farmer's wife. She mothered 10 children, two lost to diphtheria, and she was the midwife in the community, and the traveling clergy knew that they would find hospitality in her home. She was also a weaver. This is one of her shuttles. And this rug was woven on the loom where she wove rag carpets for her own home and for the wider community. We might say also that she was a committed weaver of the life of her commons. Similarly, my great-grandfather, John Anderson, would not build their home other than a Saudi until he had first built the church and the schoolhouse. Then he built their stone house and also imported stronger horses in order to um, help the economy of the entire community. <coughs> Larry and I visited the little church. And as I passed a bulletin board with letters cut out to read commitment, I realized, of course, that the seeds of my work had been planted long before, that I am the beneficiary of a legacy of commitment to the common good passed from my great-grandmother Matilda to her daughter Clara to my mother Alois, who invited everyone to my birthday party. <laughs> is a sense of the commons. And indeed, the, the practice of the commons flourishes here. And uh, we know that in our farmers markets and our coffee shops and our seeing each other at the Clyde or on the ferries. These are among the many places where we meet by happenstance and by intention and where we learn again and again of our shared belonging. Indeed, um, we could be very tempted at this time in our world's history when we are being asked to live at one of those great hinge points marked by enormous challenges and deep fear. We could be tempted to island life in the illusion of escape and safety. Our reach is to create a microcommons in which, in something like a laboratory, we learn together how we're going to create a more just and verdant world for all. Mm -hmm. And we are hard at it. Mm -hmm. Truly, our practice of the commons is imperfect, as the practice always is. But when we are at our best, we reach to include everyone. Good Cheer Food Bank, Hearts and Hammers, Friends of Friends, Mother Mentors, Whidbey Island Transit, and the Whidbey Commons, to name a few. Well, I suggest, might mean not only women of Whidbey, but the way of Whidbey. Mm -hmm. Well, as we celebrate it here this evening, is a wonderful example of the way of Whidbey. As we are each learning how we are part of each other, weaving together the shared fabric of our common life, daily, just possibly, creating a legacy for generations still to come on behalf of the small island planet home we all share. Wow. <laughs>